Welcome everyone uh, to the final keynote address of the 2020 ISPP virtual conference and annual meeting. Uh, as you probably know by now, I'm Nick Valentino, your outgoing president. I hope everyone's doing well on this last day of the conference. I wanna remind you quickly that if you've missed panels or keynotes that you'd really like to see, you can now feel free to go back to those days, the prior days of the conference on the main webpage and click on them to see those recordings. Those recordings will be available through August for all of you. And you can, of course, email each other and follow up with questions and request papers and, and really make use of and extend the material that we've all presented over the last few days, uh, even more than we would normally be able to do in a face-to-face -face conference. Today, we have an address from George Marcus last year's winner of the Harold Laswell Award, which is one of the highest honors for lifetime scholarly achievements given by ISPP. I'll first warn you that Professor Marcus is unable to be with us online right now. He submitted a video of his address. Uh, the length of that video leaves me with very little time to make an adequate introduction for him, uh, nor to, to give us time to discuss the work with you afterwards to take questions, because I must run off to the next session, which is the award ceremony, and I really hope all of you will be able to uh, attend that. So obviously, while George currently carries the title of emeritus, uh, he still has so much that he wants to share with us. And that's, if you know him, that's that's quite typical. So that's why the video is, is bursting at the seams for our time. Uh, but given that he's won nearly every award given by ISPP and served in every leadership role uh, and supported us uh, in many other ways, uh, perhaps I need only say a few words. So Dr. George Marcus is Professor Emeritus of Political Science at Williams College. He received his PhD from Northwestern in 1968 uh, and has been at Williams ever since. The committee that selected him last year to receive the Lastwell Award said, quote, Marcus has made foundational contributions in multiple areas of political psychology over a period of five decades, beginning with his work on belief systems in the 1960s and continuing with his work on political tolerance and mo most recently, of course, his longstanding program on the influence of emotion in political thought and behavior. It's not an exaggeration to say that Professor Marcus's work has helped to bring the disciplines of political science and social and cognitive psychology together to forge the field we now know of as political psychology. I could go on and on. George is, is a personal friend and, um, and, a, and an inspiration to me in many ways, but I'll just let you watch his, his lecture and please then join me in the award ceremony after that ends. Please enjoy George's lecture called What Can We See and What, what We Can See and What We Do Not, The Different Roles of Emotion in the Rise of the Far Right. Thank you all. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening as we're all spread around the world in various places. Uh, first, I'm glad you're here, wherever that may be. And as this is a first such experience for me, without being able to see who I'm talking to, or seeing uh, what you're reacting to and the like, this is gonna be a bit of a challenge, but hopefully the presentation will uh, initiate a a willingness and eagerness to explore some of our familiar topics, but from new points of view and with new theoretical understandings that can guide us. So a very brief summary, uh, and that is that the rise of national populist parties in Europe and elsewhere has obviously gained a lot of attention. The journal Political Psychology has published a number of articles on that topic, as have many others. As I note on the slide, there is a common wisdom, which I believe is uh, distinctly wrong. And I have three stories to tell. One is to examine the conventional account and its roots and its consequence, to explore whether it is can be sustained in light of uh, the most recent work done on how people respond to threat. The conclusion of, the, of that consideration will lead to story number two, and that story concerns the extent to which uh, it the, the story 
has a psychology underlying it that has two foundational claims that I believe can be shown to be incorrect. That leads to the second story, which is how do we replace it? What would be a better psychological model to guide our inquiries? And then third, a story which I will try to use some recently uh, done analyses on some existing data to show what possible promise this new psychology might have. So let's begin with what we think we know uh, and by think, I mean, by and large, what everybody who has been working in this field has been uh, saying about this for a very long time. Here from a uh, Los Angeles Times, I believe, op-ed explaining why Donald Trump in Europe uh, and other leaders have been able to gain a measure of success they had not previously been able to uh, achieve and the extent to which that is the result of fear as being the key factor in that analysis. So, notice that uh, psychologist Gelfand also tells us that the core root is that fear leads to a search for security and that leads to strong, a demand for stronger leadership, hence an inclination towards conformity and towards authoritarianism. And she asserts that recent research demonstrates that. So let's examine that inquiry a bit. We, looking at the very same election uh, she focuses on, that is Le Pen's run for the presidency in 2017. As it happens, uh, I have data that was collected in part by a group of us, including President Nick Valentino, uh, Marshal Foucault and Pavlos Vassilopoulos, both uh, then at Sciences Po, where they asked us, the, that is the French National Election Survey Group asked us to make some suggestions about how best to get at the emotional reactions people have and how those emotional measures might inform our understanding of what's going on. So I'll give you a brief discussion of what was in that uh, study, but as you can see on the slide, it's fairly rich in that we have multiple measures for fear and multiple measures for anger. And we have those not about candidates or parties or programs, but about four different topics. Now, what's interesting to us and why we selected them or proposed them was that the first two would be of interest to just about everybody. Anyone in France and in other countries would be interested in how their nation is doing and therefore would presumably have an emotional sense of that, much like in the United States, the right track, wrong track, track question is used to get at the same assessment. Similarly, the state of the economy is usually of interest to everyone, rich and poor, uh, young and old, and so forth. On the other hand, the latter two are generally of interest, have been pretty much much more prominent in the discourse among people on the far right, among populist party leaders, and their attempts to reach and bond with their followers. Notice that here we have actually two data sets, one which was the uh, official French national election study. And the second one, we uh, secured some resources to enable us to essentially duplicate the same basic core of that study with the German parliamentary election that occurred not many months after the French uh, presidential election. Hence, we have the same kinds of measures, indeed the same measures in both data sets on two different elections, all done in the same year, 2017, and with, as you see, the dependent variable being how much inclined are people to vote for Le Pen in the first round or alternative for Deutschland, uh, alternative for Germany, the far right party in, in Germany. I'm gonna show you a series of plots. I'm only gonna show you the plots for the state of the nation and immigration because the other two largely show the same thing and rather than getting tons of slides thrown at you, which tell essentially the same repetitive story. They all come out the same way. I'm going to only show you one of the more important general themes that would be of interest to everyone, 
and the second study being a theme that is high, it's the center of Le Pen's appeal and the center of Alternative for Deutschland uh, in Germany, the immigration topic. So what you'll see are plots where the, uh, as you see on this slide, levels of fear go from left, very low, to the maximum we can record on the far right. And as you see, these slopes suggest that there's something to the ancient wisdom that fear causes people to vote for the far right. On each of the four windows inside this slide, you can see rising slopes where indeed with respect to immigration, uh, Le Pen's support almost doubles, more than doubles as you go from low to high. And indeed in the German data, the increase in support or likelihood to voting for the AFD goes up by uh, that much, and indeed in some instances, even slightly more. But there's a reason why we shouldn't trust this. And that's the, uh, as those of you who know quantitative analysis quite well, is the quote, dreaded third variable problem, that these results would not hold up so well if we actually had a fully specified proper model. So what's missing? Well. What's missing is any measure of anger in the analysis. Now, if you're an appraisal theorist or you rely on appraisal theories, that shouldn't be a problem because one of the underlying presumptions of appraisal theories is that people at the end of this serial sequence of analyses arrive at an emotional destination, a specific discrete emotion. Hence, if they are fearful, that's what they are. You don't need to concern yourself about whether they're sad or feeling lonely or any other emotion because the, the presumption is that emotions in cognitive appraisal theory are what I would characterize as monochromatic. They are what they are. So if they're fearful, you need not worry about what else they might be. Well, let's take a look at what happens when we challenge that assumption. So as you may recall, a moment ago, I mentioned we also have measures of anger in these same two data sets. So let's see what happens to the effect of fear on support for the far right when we control for anger. As you can see, the slopes radically change their, their character. All of the slopes become far less indicative of support for Le Pen on the left or AFD on the right. And indeed, in one case, in the upper left corner, you see the slope actually becomes negative. None of these are statistically significant. Again, just to review, fear measured without any control for anger and what happens when you control for anger. This also invites us to examine what is happening when we look at the levels of anger as the possible impact they might have on voting for candidates or parties on the far right populist parties that are present in actually probably every single country that has democratic elections. As you can see, the effects are really quite robust. Indeed, in the case of uh, Le Pen, her support more, just about doubles in both of the case of feelings about anger about the condition of France in the case of Alternative for Deutschland, it almost triples the levels of support. So why are we wedded to this story about fear producing support for the far right? Well, psychologist Gelfand put it in scientific language, but if you look for that same account, you'll find it has been with us probably from the very beginning of human experience, at least to the extent that we have it recorded. I haven't done an enormous amount of research on this, indeed very little, to be quite honest, but here's one example of exactly how old this story is. Millennia before there was any notion of what we now conceive of as science existed, we see the same story. In the upper level, you can see a quote from uh, the famous Psalm 23, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. Here you see the same story. The world is filled with all kinds of evil, all kinds of threats. And we know that because we are fearful. And the resolution of that fear is to keep us safe. And in this case, safety is obtained by binding us 
to fidelity to God. God will secure us against the shadow of death and against evil. Thomas Hobbes, not quite 200, uh, a little bit more than 2,000 years later, tells exactly the same story, again in a very famous quote from the Leviathan. Here also you see the same story, but rather than trusting to God to keep us secure, man invents this great figure, the Leviathan, and carries to that person sovereign control over life and death to keep us all safe from, again, the same problems of living in a world filled with evil, filled with danger, filled with threats. Religious version at the top, secular version at the bottom. By the way, that second version that Hobbes told causes the, him to have to flee England for uh, the European uh, continent because the king was not too pleased to be told he was merely a creation of the people he ruled. He much preferred the oldest story was he was God's designated uh, representative on earth. A little side note, uh, don't annoy people if you can't live with the consequences. But there's another foundation on which our understanding of the human condition exists, and that is what I've called here the reality presumption. This dates back, actually, to at least Plato, where he creates this famous distinction between passion on the one hand, unruly, mysterious, turbulent, and reason on the other. And obviously, that distinction rests with us, and I mention that because that distinction between reason on the one hand and passion on the other is something I'm going to challenge as we go along. But notice it's not just a categorical distinction, there's a normative one. That is, reason is what gives us the best accounts of how to order our lives. Again, this dates back at least to the Stoics in ancient Greece, a very old presumption that has rested with us for a long time and has shaped our understanding of the world and ourselves both before and now during the scientific era. The impact of emotion is thought to be anti-rational indeed, because if reason is the place where rationality rests and emotion is outside that, it follows by definition that rationality is degraded when reason is left and interpreted by or impacted by emotion. And indeed, that's formalized in an artful and very clever use of uh, experimental data, uh, which we call prospect theory. Here's a famous diagram from it, to which I've added this red line, which makes the argument of what strict rationality is, what, that is to say utility theory. A dollar gained is a dollar lost, it is rational there to count dollars exactly the same, no, mu no matter what else is going on. But as you see here, it's found in these experiments that humans depart from rationality uh, quite easily and, and, and famously. Now, this is obviously a widely known understanding of how human beings make judgments, that these departures are A, caused by emotional factors, and the impact of those emotional factors is to create departures from rationality, all of which seems to confirm this old and new and still current claim about the role of emotions and its impact on rationality. So my argument is that much of this is at least problematic, and as I've shown you, uh, doesn't actually stand up when you look at models or theoretical accounts that differ from the ancient one of threat causing fear, fear demanding that we endorse sovereign authority, strengthen it. And as we saw, at least in the elections of Germany and in uh, France and other comparable studies done elsewhere, uh, that doesn't hold up very well once you take into account the impact of anger. So my argument is summarized in the four points you can see on the slide. What I'm going to argue is that 
actually that finding that anger plays a very robust role that has been largely uh, until re recently, I'd say in the last 15, 20 years, been left uh, out of the analysis, outside the frame of reference, is not a, should not be a surprise because cognitive theory uh, of emotion really don't offer us the, the theoretical tools to come up with a better account. And here's why. First, cognitive appraisal theories rely on a, a theory of perception that we now know to be largely false. Also, as I've shown you, there's a, evidence that suggests that the cognitive appraisal notion that people are normally in a state of one discrete emotion or another is also largely uh, shown to be false in numerous studies. And that rationality is not the sole property that plays out in conscious awareness. It also plays out elsewhere. And that the presumption that emotion is the source of bias and irrationality, I will also argue, is incorrect. So to do that, I obviously have to communicate with you with words, either written on the screen or presented uh, to you through my voice. But I want you to be understand that I am really quite dubious about the success of my ability to do that because words are a, a rather crude mechanism. They may be the best we have, but they're rather crude. So let me walk through some quick, easy examples of this, of the dilemma of working with words that we presume have a shared meaning and an accurate meaning. So in this slide, one of my favorite quotes from uh, this Edmund Burke, but let's look at the two images below. They both are describing a wave, one by a human being and one by the water crashing on a beach. Common meaning, very different applications. Which am I talking about? Well, you need to know more than just the word wave because it can be applied to very different things and not just these two. Similarly, a word may actually have different meanings. So on the left, the word bear describes the whole cluster of bears, polar bears, black bears, grizzly bears, and the like. And on the right, the word bear meaning to bear arms, to carry a, a, a weapon, typically in a military context. But even there, again, these words pose a problem because there are lots of kind of bears and we want to know more about this man. Uh, is he someone we can trust? And if we can't trust him, on what basis can we trust him? Because being around a weapon, is it loaded or not? Is his finger pulling the trigger or just lying in a passive way against the trigger? Second, is he affiliated with the NRA or is he with the Black Panthers? And depending on who you are and what your politics are, at least if you're an American, that information may have grave consequence in how you react to that particular person. But another point I want to make, and here we can see that in this next slide, is we use a word, as I mentioned, to describe a, a characteristic of the world but in a very crude way. And that's the point I want to make, that our words are often much cruder than the world we are living in. The human eye can discern differences between something like 10 million colors. In the range of blue, they're probably close to a million discernible varieties of blue. We do not have a million words to describe each unique variant as we go from left near to violet to right, near to white. So our words are consequential, but they're often rather crude. Indeed, if you went into a paint store and said, I'd like some blue paint because I have a wall I want to cover, the next question out of the clerk's mouth will be, well, we have lots of blues, which one do you want? And probably you'd be in a some time of 15 or 20 minutes looking at samples and deciding which color chips look right to you and to your partner or others who might be living with you. 
And if you want their consensus, they'd be doing the same thing. Just calling someone on the phone and saying, uh, I like a teal. How about a teal wall? Anyone who answers on the other side saying, yes, sure, that'd be fine, is probably not very interested in the exact shade of blue you've selected. Happily, cell phones have pretty good cameras in them, but as you probably know, there are color shifts. So the color shown in the picture may not actually match the color on the paint. And of course, the amount of light that is available in the room and the kind, is it halogen or whatever, all those influence what the color looks like to us. I'm going to come back to color in a moment, but let me summarize uh, now the, the problem that cognitive appraisal theory has. So a famous quote, this one from Schachter and Singer, on how psychology of perception informs our understanding of what emotions are. We see something in the world that gives us the opportunity to think about it, to label it, and then to react to it as something we either like or dislike. And so again, the model goes from perception to thinking to feeling. And I've given two examples below. Uh, a nice picture of a wild river with mountains in the background. We identify that fairly quickly, beautiful landscape. And depending on our feeling, we might feel calm or happy. We might describe the emotion thusly that we experience in response to what we've just seen. So perception first, thinking about the representation we've just seen, second and third, the discrete emotional state. In the slide, at the bottom of the slide, a picture of uh, an older man with a beard, a good deal longer than the beard I wear, uh, looking somewhat perturbed. So we see the man, we characterize him, he's an older man, and then depending on how we react to that image, you might describe it as angry or upset or some other such word. So again, perception, cognition, and some discrete emotional state that flows from our thinking about what we've just seen or experienced. I'm going to introduce what we now know about perception at a very simple level, overly simple, but to make some key important points. Now, this is a very dense slide and my apologies for it. But so how do we in fact see? Well, light enters each of our eyes through the pupil. That light is then achieves focus on the back of our eyeballs called the retina. And each of our retinas have hundreds of millions of cells of two kinds, rods and cones, that convert the light that strikes that cell into an electrical signal. All those millions of electrical signals are then sent back into the brain for analysis. So we don't see the world except via these electronic signals that descend through the optic nerve. Some of the cells sending information about how much light there is, that's what the rods do. And then the very much smaller number of cones record the specific activity along a specific region of the wavelengths on which they are sensitive to, as you can see in the uh, distribution of receptivity and responsiveness to the blue cones, rods, greens, and red cones. What I've tried to indicate is what happens after it ride, it, the, these electrical signals arrive at V1, at the very back of our brain. There are two, one receiving information from the left eyeball and one receiving information from the right eyeball. That information is sent to various regions of the visual cortex, V1, where it begins, then V2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and various other regions, M2 is another one, where and this is a very important point, the brain begins to do multiple concurrent analyses to try to identify what those electrical signals are telling us about. What am I seeing? Other regions are trying to, are specifically dedicated to facial recognition and other regions specifically to color representation and so forth. 
That is, rather than doing th these things in a sequence, the brain gains tremendous advantages by doing these analyses in parallel. So the region that's allocate, that's devoted to identifying object identification is doing its work at roughly the same time with inputs and outputs coming from various other senses as well about object movement. And by doing so, the brain gets the ability to react much more swiftly than saying, oh, before I react, I need to know all of these and then integrate them. And in fact, consciousness is where we get that integrated understanding of what we're seeing, its color, its location, whether it's moving or not, what it is, have we seen it before, is it familiar, and the, and the like. And notice in the middle to the right, what was in that mysterious, what that mysterious box was, once the brain processes all that information, says, oh, it's a blue book with a particular shade of blue. But notice that it takes about 500 milliseconds for that integration to take place. So major point, conscious awareness is impoverished. That is, we do not see what those hundred of million cells are sending to the brain. What we see is what the brain decides is important from that. And there's an extraordinary degree of down sampling that occurs in conscious awareness. Second, conscious awareness is a late representation across all these senses because it takes time to not only integrate all these elements of vision, those elements also have to be coordinated with touch, sound, and, and the other senses as well. So conscious awareness is a late representation. Moreover, conscious awareness cannot really act because it's occurring too late. If something is coming at us, we're not gonna wait a half second, the brain will act. So pre-conscious assessments enable us to act far earlier, far more fully informed, hence more accurately, hence more deftly. So perception is occurring before conscious awareness as a regular characteristic of how we understand the world. We have conscious awareness, which gives us a late virtual representation that's impoverished, but useful. And if that's all we had, we would be really unable to function in the world without the availability of these pre-conscious understandings that are informing our actions. Now, where does emotion play into this? Notice I've identified two places in which emotion has been used to describe what's going on. The familiar notion of emotion, I feel blue, I feel angry. How are you feeling today? That's what I've labeled here emotion B. The kind of emotion that has made up the work of a number of us, some associated in research teams, some uh, fellow travelers, if you like, uh, under the rubric of effective intelligence, are concerned with what is emotion doing before conscious awareness. And the most important thing I want you to take away from this is this timeline in the middle. T0 is when those electrical signals, perhaps from the auditory cortex, certainly uh, also from uh, the optic nerve arrive in the brain and from the other senses, it takes about 30 to 100 milliseconds for appraisals to take place of what that information is telling and actions to flow soon thereafter, not waiting for the 500 milliseconds, but taking place as swiftly as possible, given what those early appraisals enable us to understand about the world. Unlike emotion in cognitive appraisal land, where the presumption is at any given moment we have a dominant discrete emotional as our current state. Instead, we have multiple continuous assessments, and I've labeled them. Most of you will probably be familiar with these, but I'll go into that in a bit more detail briefly. The other difference between these two accounts, emotion A and emotion B, is normative. The presumption of effective intelligence theory is that these effective appraisals 
are functionally valuable, indeed essential to human performance. Whereas emotion B, the normative assumption is that emotional engagements create biases and that degrades our ability for rational decision-making. So a considerable difference in normative outlook. So under the theory of effective intelligence, we've long held that, along with other psychological accounts, that there are two states of consciousness. One familiar to, I'm sure everyone in, the, in uh, watching this session, we call motivated reasoning. S similar work was done before that term was coined by any number of psychologists and, uh, and indeed scholars well before that, recognize that human beings acquire habits of thought as well as habits of action and are re reluctant to depart from them and indeed are likely to even deny uh, a bit the possibility that there's useful evidence that might contradict those habits of thought. Think of the names such as Fessinger, Rokich, among many others, who also made the same broad claim. Many of you will be familiar with Danny Kahneman's uh, book, uh, Thinking Fast, Thinking Slow. Motivated reasoning fits under his label of System 1. Other uh, psychologists have uh, applied other names. Jonathan Haidt used the term intuitive to describe uh, System 1 or motivated reasoning. System 2 we've called motivated deliberation. That is where the brain is used to shape consciousness so that we can create increasing awareness of new possibilities, new understandings, and we're actually quite open to new possibilities that arise therefrom. So how, let's return now to our fundamental topic. How do we understand threat? From the effective intelligence point of view, the brain is doing two analyses at the same time because each have vital strategic consequences. So rather than doing in a serial sequence, which would give one priority and other delayed importance, they are both so essential that they're both done at the same time. So when we observe what might be a possible threat, there are two things we want to know. Is this the kind of threat where someone is challenging or violating the social norms that make our world safe, predictable, and successful? And the appraisal that executes that assessment is anger, varying from none at all, when everybody is being congenially compliant, to rage and hatred at the extreme when something really dashedly is going on. And there are any number of dashedly things we can point to in examples, and in the study I'm going to describe shortly, we'll come up with some. But the second appraisal is also equally strategically important and is equally important enough to, be, to warrant immediate analysis to gain the swiftest answer to the second question, which is, is something unusual or is this the same situation that I've had before? I'm driving to work, uh, traffic is flowing quite nicely, unknown to me, a bridge I have to cross has washed out because of a, a severe uh, rainstorm that hit overnight. And normally I could drive that route with my eyes closed, but if the bridge is out, my brain wants to know about that as quickly as possible so that I can prevent myself from driving into the surging river below and obviously facing the risk of death. So these two things occur simultaneously, concurrently, and as you notice in this diagram, independently. Now, one of the most re reoccurring findings is that liberals and conservatives tend to differ in terms of their inclination to engage in one or the other. Conservatives are more inclined to engage as, as motivated reasoners and liberals somewhat more inclined to engage in deliberation about new possibilities. Notice that I have not indicated that the effect of ideological identification is carried through its effects on emotion, either anger, propensity, 
or uncertainty propensity. It might be true, but let's see what the data tells us. So the model right now says there is that bias. We're going to look for that bias, but not how it arrived. As it turns out with my colleagues, uh, Michael McEwen and Russ Newman, we created uh, three different studies uh, through the generosity of the National Science Foundation. We weren't planning on combining them, but as it turns out, to explore this possibility of this new psychology, they turn out to be quite useful because they're essentially identical. The only difference between the three is that the topic of the experiment is slightly different. So the first one explores how people react to understand Al-Qaeda terrorism. Second one focuses on the financial and economic crisis that began in 2006 and continued on and perhaps still has linger, lingering effects on us even today. And a, a topic usually not much of interest to political scientists, but what about food safety? We thought that would be a nice contrast to the two political studies. What was the experiment? In each exp ex experiment, people were asked to read a story, and there were three. So they were randomly assigned to read one of three stories about Al-Qaeda terrorism, or one of three stories about the financial and economic crisis of the early 2000s. And in the third story, they were asked to read, randomly assigned to read one of three stories about the possibility of threats to food safety. After reading their assigned story, they completed the affective intelligence theory affect battery. For more details than that, you can read the article we published a few years ago in Political Science Research and Methods. Uh, in the, I think I've added that to the reference list that is appended to these slides. They then responded to a variety of other measures, each including a variety of different things specific to each study, but in common, they enabled us to actually measure uh, these different motivated reasoning, motivated deliberation orientations that I spoke of a moment ago. But before I turn to that, let's look at, uh, so you can get somewhat familiar with the stories. These are snippets of the stories, not the entire stories. And I've selected one from each of the three experiments. So you can see their rough sim uh, similarity. That is, each of them had pictures, characterizing the situation as being familiar or not, as uh, norm-violating or not, or benign or not. And uh, they were uh, roughly the same length and presented in, in essentially the same way, but again, randomly assigned to each individual. Immediately after they read the, their story, the very next slide presented them with the affective intelligence battery, which they then uh, responded to. Here I'm going to focus on the two emotional uh, topics that are of interest to us, anger and fear, which we had, as we have seen from the first study I presented, anger is very influential, but fear does not seem to be playing the role we expected of it. So what happens as people read this study? What kinds of emotional responses do they give? That's displayed on this slide. As you can see, I've displayed not only the mean value, but the distributions. Because each of us are unique individuals with specific histories of differences of age, familiarity with the topic at hand, uh, gender, etc., and so forth. So the perspective that each of our brains approaches is unique. My brain is mine, and I have no way of knowing how your brain would identify and respond to this. So as you can see, there's considerable distribution, disagreement. So even when people are presented with a very uncertain story, in this case from the terror story example, uh, you can see there are people who record extremely high levels of fear, and other people, very small number, who respond with very low levels of fear, those are the tails, if you like. But most people are centered well above the mean at a heightened level of fear, which is what we'd expect. In the case of the normative violation story in the uh, Al-Qaeda terrorism story, uh, 
you can see the focus on Al Qaeda, on bin Laden, on that picture of the Twin Towers being attacked by U.S. airplanes driving into them at the instant of impact. That makes people very angry, but it also makes people highly uncertain. And I wanted to emphasize the extent to which this is essentially a result we've shown in numerous of our other studies or public or articles. That is, people do not normally feel only angry or only fearful. They are getting a report from their brain, how unusual is this and how much known violation is going on. These go up or down because each is focused on a granular question. And each granular question is of strategic importance. And that's the essential feature of the pre-conscious brain doing parallel processing on strategically vital information that the brain wants as rapidly as possible. So as you can see, by and large, these results are consistent with what we'd expect given the treatments, the stories we created with just one exception on the very far right. The story we thought would emphasize normative violation and were written that way, actually produced slightly more fear among most of the people who read it than anger, although both fear and anger are both much higher than the benign story about how safe our food was. So let's revisit the, uh, the AIT model of threat. Notice it's the same as we saw before, but I focused, I added some details to motivated reasoning. How are we going to operationalize motivated reasoning and how are we going to operationalize motivated deliberation? Obviously, those are very broad categories and rather than try to convey a scale that characterizes all the features, the different facets of each, we have four items which we can use to gain uh, some degree of certitude about how people are responding to that threat story they just read. The first, which we call partisan certitude, is essentially trying to find out to what extent people feel that they must unify around traditional uh, convictions, traditional loyalties, traditional certainties, and not depart from them. And those were the first two items you see in the table before you. For political open-mindedness, our measure of one facet of motivated deliberation, here we're looking at our people actually now responding to this as well. Who knows what's going on here? What, what's going on here? And the only way to get to a good sound decision is by listening to everyone. So these two pairs of items correlate nicely with each other for you know, reasonably good scales with just two items. We'd like to have more, but these two items do a, a nice job, certainly on face validity grounds on the basis of that. And it's worth pointing out that the two scales and the individual items, if you run the correlations, are, a, are not valenced. They're a, orthogonal to each other. That is, partisan certitude can range from very high to very low, at the same time that a willingness to engage in political open-mindedness can also arise high to low. And because they're uncorrelated with each other, that gives us actually two analyses we can do to evaluate the, the ability of that uh, alternative psychology at work. One with partisan certitude as the dependent variable and one with political open-mindedness as a dependent variable, each looking at a different an uncorrelated facet of reasoning, uncorrelated with the other orientation. So what I'm going to show you next, relying on the process analysis that Andrew Hayes developed in psychology of converting experimental data into a path analysis, because as you remember from the slide, these are mediated models. The threat on the left is understood through two parallel appraisals. And those two parallel appraisals then are thought to impact on these conscious awareness states of motivated reasoning and motivated deliberation. So let's look at that result. Rather than presenting you a whole series of slides showing you the individual studies and their individual analyses, I refer you to a forthcoming chapter in the next uh, volume of the Sydney uh, Symposium of uh, social psychology, which will be out 
sometime next year. Here, I'm going to combine all of the data from all three studies because, in fact, what I'm showing you here characterizes what takes place in each of the studies. And so, if, if you don't trust me, you can look at the forthcoming chapter, but I hope uh, you'll find what I show uh, in the slide is to be trusted. So, in each analysis, we look at three pairwise experiments. The normative ionization treatment, that is people who read the story filled with leaders and others doing things that most of us would consider to be vile and contemptible, normative violation, against those who responded after reading the benign story. UN refers obviously to uncertainty. Again, to keep the slide simple, I've uh, not produced a third set of comparisons. That is between the normative violation story, when anger is high, and the uncertain story, when fear is high. And indeed, as you remember from the earlier slide showing the distributions, they're both high. But essentially, it re reproduces these results pretty much the same as before. But again, it would add a whole slew of more numbers. And this is a way of keeping it fairly simple. As you can see, let me speak first about the paths that are not shown. Why are they not shown? Because they're not significant. There's no path from the conservative ideology measure to fear. Hence, there's no pro apparent propensity for conservatives as compared to liberals to be more or less fearful. Knowing one's political ideology identification does not tell you anything about their likelihood of experiencing fear. The same applies to anger. Again, no difference between liberals and conservatives in their reactions, in their emotional assessments of the stories they were assigned to read. Two other obviously missing paths. There's no path from the reading a story to willingness to engage in partisan certitude. That confirms the, that these experiments were successful and showing that the way we understand things is through either the emotional appraisal of fear or the emotional appraisal of anger. And lastly, and most importantly, there's an absence of a link from fear to partisan certitude. Partisan certitude is solely a function of the pathway going from the level of anger in response to the story you've read to partisan certitude on the far right. Notice this holds true whether you, we compare the normative violation story readers to the benign story readers, it's also true for those who read the uncertain story compared to those who read the benign story across the board. That is to say, no matter whether we try to make uncertainty really prominent or not, fear does not influence partisan certitude. And again, no matter whether we try to make normative violations prominent or not, it is anger that influences partisan certitude. What happens when we switch our dependent variable to the political open-mindedness? Again, very similar results. As in the prior slide, there is an ideological propensity. In this case, conservatives are tilted towards a, 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 being comfortable with partisan certitude as their default, and liberals are less so. And with respect to political open-mindedness, the difference is modestly greater. Here, liberals are more inclined to engage in political open-mindedness. But again, as with the, the prior slide, there's no indication that conservative ideological, ideological identification, excuse me, is influenced the level of fear reported or the level of anger reported. Lastly, again, it's fully mediated through fear so political open mind is, is responsive to fear. It is not responsive to anger. So a few closing remarks. It is anger, I argue, as have others, that is fueling nativist parties. But anger is useful not just for people on the right, as we can see throughout the world in Hong Kong, in the United States, and in Europe. Anger is a powerful fuel that comes when people feel that their way of life and the norms that guide their way of life are being attacked.
There's a normative story, and that is, although there are other accounts of threat and fear and anger and the like in psychology, there are other models of, of threat, none of them have much of the way of effect beyond the academy. Politicians, elected and authoritarian leaders, non-elected and elected alike, journalists, pundits, and the public have been told over and over again for thousands of years that when we are facing a, a threat, it is fear as the only thing we have to worry about, in the famous words paraphrased badly, are Franklin Delano Roosevelt during the Great Depression. But responding to threat as if it is fear and only fear is going to leave us relatively helpless in responding effectively when what's really driving much of the public response is anger. Because response to anger means identifying the grievances that are at hand and addressing how best to meet and resolve those grievances because that's what anger is signaling us has to be done. Finally, effective intelligence theory radically changes how we think about consciousness, about rationality, and about emotion. Indeed, those words turn out to be not terribly helpful because as I've described what pre-conscious evaluations are taking place using anger and fear, that's a highly cognitive account. Emotion is very cognitive. And it produces rational outcomes. It gives us a more deft, successful mode of interacting with the world. And that sounds like a very rational outcome. So there's a normative story here. And that normative story is that Anger has long played a vital role in making a social world manageable because it acts to identify what's going on. But we have a paucity of words to correctly identify that. Indeed, for example, to use the immigration issue, people reacting to, the, to new immigrants settling into their communities as xenophobic is a misnomer. Xenophobic means fear of the other. But it's not fear that's driving these people's response. It's anger, and we don't have a word for that. Let me spend just a quick moment on this, but just to point out that we've been given language that instructs us that the need for any society begins with constructing a social order that is just. And we live at a time now when that order is being heavily challenged. As a result, unless we pay attention to that, as I indicated in my analysis here of the preamble to the U.S. Constitution, they tell us you only can get a, a defensible social order by establishing justice. Anger helps in that service, but so also does fear. Anger protects the existing modes of justice that the majority of the dominant groups have Fear creates the possibility of creating a more just society by getting people to withdraw their commitments to older notions of justice and explore newer notions of justice, and that's to our best. But we're not the only species for which this understanding applies. So let me stop for a while and let you engage with a demonstration of how humans share with other species about the fundamental role of anger in creating a just world. And with that, I thank you for your uh, attention throughout. So a final experiment that I want to mention to you is our fairness study. Uh, and so this, this became a very famous study and there's now many more because after we did this about 10 years ago, uh, it became uh, very well known. And we did that originally with capuchin monkeys, and I'm going to show you the first experiment that we did. It has now been done with dogs, and with birds, and with chimpanzees, um, with, but with Sarah Brosnan, we started out with capuchin monkeys. So what we did is we put two capuchin monkeys side by side. Again, these animals, they live in a group, they know each other, we take them out of the group, put them in a test chamber. And there's a very simple task that they need to do, 
And if you give both of them cucumber for the task, the two monkeys side by side, they're perfectly willing to do this 25 times in a row. So cucumber, even though it's really only water in my opinion, but cucumber <laughs> is perfectly fine for them. Now if you give the partner grapes, the, the, the food preferences of my capuchin monkeys correspond exactly with the prices in the supermarket. And so if you give them grapes, it's a far better food, uh, then you create inequity between them. So that's the experiment we did. Recently, we videotaped it with new monkeys who had never done the task, uh, thinking that maybe they would have a stronger reaction, and that turned out to be right. The one on the left is the monkey who gets cucumber. The one on the right is the one who gets grapes. The one who gets cucumber, note that the first piece of cucumber is perfectly fine. The first piece she eats. Uh, then she sees the other one getting grape, and you will see what happens. So she gives a rock to us, that's the task and we give her a piece of cucumber and she eats it. The other one needs to give a rock to us. And that's what she does. And she gets a grape. And she eats it. The other one sees that. She gives a rock to us now, gets again cucumber. She tests the rock now against the wall. She needs to give it to us. And she gets cucumber again. <laughs> so this is basically the Wall Street protest that you see here. 